and welcome to Alternative to Meds podcast. And I am so excited to introduce an integrative psychiatrist that is becoming increasingly popular um, and sought after, Dr. Don Engel. Hi, Debbie. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Um, when I, I tell people all the time that when we go out and I'm seeking to find these integrative approaches to be able to expose the work and have people feel as if there's avenues for treatment, when I read truly someone like yourself doing this work, it make, gets me really excited. So I always like to kind of start like, what's your story of how you got into this and what's your definition of what integrative is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... Well, I'd say probably the biggest initial entry for me into psychiatry was two weeks before medical school when I dove off a beer, uh, a pier in the Gulf of Mexico, landed on a sandbar, broke my neck, and wore a halo for the first three months of medical school. So it slowed me down a lot and got me a lot in, more interested in neurology and psychiatry. And when I did my clinical rotations in medical school, it was just more and more of a good fit. And when you become board certified, you get certified in both psychiatry and neurology. So I ended up going deep down those rabbit holes. Uh, also had six pretty bad concussions on my own. And my last of which, um, just about 20 years ago, the physicians and neurologists I was working with at the time didn't have any really good solutions for post-concussive syndrome. So I started researching it and putting myself in the lab and trying to find out what program programs, protocols, supplements, strategies work really well, what don't work, and then ended up putting the things that worked for me and worked for a vast majority of clients that I had also supported. I put those into the concussion repair manual because I wanted people that just have that information to know that if you do have a concussion and you end up having long-term symptoms as a result, there are treatment strategies that work. I think that's the part that most people they disassociate the brain as different than anything else within the body and don't realize that there's protocols and therapeutic measures that are highly effective to be able to help them um and there is like a disassociation that somehow it's not the same like you know there's still therapies that are highly highly effective so what are some of the things that you have found i know like there's many modalities of healing that you're versed in what are some of the top things that you utilize Mm -hmm. Well, when I think of strategies for healing the brain from injury, it's always good to start with the basics. And what I mean by that is the things that fundamentally are necessary for building life. That's oxygen, water, nutrition, movement, sunlight, frequency technologies, all of these things that essentially are at the core root of all life on the planet. And if we start there, then at least we have a solid foundation to work from. Because a lot of times if people bonk their heads, one or many of those is significantly deficient. So if people's diet is off, it's going to significantly impact how well their brain can heal. If they spend all their time inside in front of screens and not outside in nature with fresh, fresh oxygen environments, good sunlight, their vitamin D might be in the tank. And if that's the case, then it's going to affect their thyroid. It's going to affect all their other hormones. And the hormones drive energetic cellular respiration, as does nutrition, oxygen, and frequency. And so when we just solidify that ground level matrix, so to speak, 75 to 80% of clients will get significant benefit just from that. Now, that can be even if people have severe concussions. So if we just talk about terminology, concussion usually means mild to moderate traumatic brain injury. People that have a severe traumatic brain injury, there's a lot of immediate triage and emergency care that has to happen. And then once they're stabilized, you come back to the basics. What's their diet? What's their nutrition? What's their movement plan and strategy? What are their detoxif detoxification channels like? Are they open and are they working? Or are they compromised for some reason? Like maybe that person has a metabolic deficiency or they have a genetic impairment in their ability to detoxify. So there's a variety of ground level matrix solutions. And then we build from there into the therapeutic arena. 
So we assess people's hormone status, their immune system status, uh, their GI system. So do they have significant inflammation in their gut that's oftentimes related to diet, but not all the time. And if we're not looking at those issues and some of those are off, those are essentially what we describe as the metabolics, gut, immune system, and hormones. If one of the metabolic trees is off, then that's going to affect the nervous system's ability to heal itself. So then we go further into those therapeutics. And then base level therapeutics that are good for just about everybody are things like acupuncture, with an acupuncturist that really knows what they're doing well, um, a breath practice and meditation practice so that people can learn to self-regulate their own amounts of stress. Stress is probably the biggest limiting factor for people to be able to heal any chronic condition, but particularly brain injuries and flotation therapy because just about everybody can float. And once you get into a sensory deprivation tank is when you really start to unwind the stress, more of the emotional landscape comes onto the mind's screen, so to speak, so that people can work with it. And it really starts to bring on what's called the parasympathetic tone or rest and relaxation. And ultimately when all of those things are in place, then the nervous system can start healing itself. I suppose the last thing I should say about fundamentals is sleep and sleep architecture. Because if people don't sleep well, their nervous system is not going to heal very well. Because that's when the nervous system heals the most is in deep restorative sleep. Everything that you're talking about, I mean, I feel like the world is craving this. They're out, everyone's seeking it. They're trying to figure out what they need to do to get themselves well, because they've gone to traditional measures and they're progressively not, not always, but a lot of people is certainly aren't getting well. And they're not realizing that there's all these steps and all these measures of keeping a person well mentally. We've talked about, you know, addiction epidemics, um, dependency on numerous medications that people are suffering with. We, you know, benzodiazepines are a big one now that we have a lot that um, people don't know how to rebuild that. And it sounds like all those measures that you do, like you said, are applicable for whatever a person would be dealing with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, coming back to the basic foundational building blocks is important for all illness to be healed and brought back into balance. Usually symptoms are just an expression of something being out of balance. So if somebody has significant depression, anxiety, PTSD, addiction, pain, usually that's a recognition that something's out of balance. So instead of suppressing the symptoms, we actually want to get to know the symptoms and sometimes shine a, a larger, brighter light on the symptoms to understand what the core factor is. And that's not to say that medications don't have their place. Right. Because in acute care stabilization, when people's symptoms are super severe and they don't have a whole lot of other options, if somebody's standing on the ledge, I'm probably going to say take an antidepressant or take a benzodiazepine or something to, to calm the severity of the symptoms so that they can at least function. And while they're regaining their function and potentially using pharmaceuticals to do that, that we're investigating what the core issues are. So ideally, medications are just used transiently while we're investigating the deeper root causes. But unfortunately, that's, how it's, that's not how it's practiced today. Many psychiatrists are really good at starting pharmaceuticals, but they're really lousy at helping people get off of them because most of us weren't trained in that kind of methodology. It was like, prescribe a medication. If that doesn't work, prescribe a different medication. <laughs> if that doesn't work, try stacking medications. Once they stop working, increase the dose. If they have side effects, prescribe a medication for that. You know, it was just continuously the same orientation. You know, and that happened 20 years ago when we thought that pharmaceuticals were going to be the end all be all for the end of mental illness. And we've seen that that is absolutely not the case because even in the midst of more and more psychopharmacology and more and more psychiatric medications being prescribed, we're still seeing epidemics in all five of the major psychiatric clusters depression, addiction, PTSD, anxiety, and pain. Consistently in each of those arenas, worse and worse. And our opportunity, if we look at the just meta position and we see that crisis precedes transformation every time, then maybe we're in the midst of a mental health crisis so that we can look at other strategies. 
and we can get really curious about other methodologies that are really helpful. Well, and I think we have a growing population that are seeking um, holistic. I think the biggest uh, problem or concern that I will find is when I'm trying to align up with other like-minded individuals, um, their idea of holistic and treatment could be art therapy um, is what they're providing. And like what I try to say all the time, a truly a holistic approach is what you would just describe is stealing everything from the biochemical to the therapeutic side. I mean, everything has to be addressed. Do you do scientific testing? I mean, when people arrive, obviously you do different testing, do you? Yeah. Yeah, we want it to be evidence-based. We want it to be as objective as possible. Um, and we're getting better and better at understanding what tests to order and in a more refined methodology. So you can order $5,000 worth of tests and get a lot of information, but not everybody can afford that and not everybody needs that degree of testing. A lot of people are getting more aware of the importance of detoxigenomics and nutrigenomics and looking at people's genetic profile to see if they have an imbalance in one of their detox channel pathway um, gene SNPs or if they have a challenge in metabolizing a particular uh, hormone into its more active form or to catalyze an enzymatic reaction to be able to move out of a toxic substance from the system. So if we look at gene profiles, that can oftentimes gives us a lot of information. Baseline level blood work, chemistry panels are always helpful. The tests that we run the most outside of just basic blood and chemistry panels are hormone panels. And if there's an indication that people's immune system is sluggish or have been challenged with a chronic infection, usually it's a viral infection or some other co-infection, then we'll look at the immune system. And if there's a pretty good indication that people have really bad food sensitivities or uh, chronic digestive symptoms, irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis, these kinds of things, then we'll order GI panels. So again, it kind of comes down to those three basic ones for us, hormones, immune system, gut function. And then you look at genetics when and if that's necessary and applicable, and oftentimes it is. And then we build on the basic blood chemistry panels. So it's pretty flexible. And that's just a kind of high level overview. Sometimes we'll do even more specific testing after that, but those are the basic ones that we start with. When you get someone and you start working with them, I mean, how long is generally, do, do you work with somebody? How long does it take? I mean, because I get that asked all the time working with alternative meds is, you know, everyone always feels as if they're the worst case scenario. Have you ever met someone as bad as what I am? And can you help them? And I always say, well, you're talking to me. I was on the other side of that fence, but, um, so this work that's being done is so vital and yet there's there's not very many people as you're you're rambling all of these things off and saying it so eloquently and wonderful um there's there's very few that are that trained that know all of these components of mental health um and those times people arrive or they come into this scenario and they're in pretty bad shape um you know because they've they've gone down traditional routes for a long time, it's wonderful if someone can start with someone like you, mm -hmm. you know, when, when the problem initially evolves instead of um, end with you, but either way it results in the same of healing and that's really, you're looking for root solutions. But I mean, you treat all different things. I mean, everything that you just finished speaking of, everything from addiction, you know, traumatic brain injuries, um, especially with your own story in your book, that's pretty powerful and mm -hmm. your growth within this. But as you go out, I mean, you're, you're a speaker at many, you know, you're going to be at the conference at IMMH. Um, how many people do you feel are like gravitating to you? Are you just feeling overwhelmed? I'm sure that are there parts of you that's overwhelmed with the amount of um, people that are wanting your services? Well, I suppose to directly answer that question, I, given the fact that I am and historically have been a primary consultant to a variety of different clients with a variety of different symptom clusters, uh, I choose to not be the bottleneck, so to speak. So I, there's only so many hours in the day and so many clients that I can see. So what I've been doing 
more recently is working with different teams and training other clinicians and building out evergreen products and programs that people can utilize on their own at home to support their own recovery and their own process of healing. So I just launched a program called Bold, Brain Optimization and Lifestyle Design. And that is specifically targeted for people healing from post-concussive syndrome at home who don't have the time, energy, resources, or availability to come to a place like Revive, our place in Denver. Uh, we're later this year, we're launching another program called Freedom From Meds, uh, which is helping people walk through a systematic um, examination and investigation of the things that are out of balance in their life in order to be able to solidify those, those root cause ground matrix issues and then use targeted supplementation and a variety of different lifestyle measures and practices to be able to gradually come off of psychiatric medications. And then the last piece that you mentioned, the talk that I'm giving at IMMH next month is on psychedelic medicines and psychedelic medical research. So if there were three arenas that I focus a lot on, it's this integrative regenerative psychiatric piece, uh, functional neurology and integrative neurocognitive restoration practices, and then psychedelic research. Because these medicines are becoming more and more widely appreciated, the data is getting more and more widely um, disseminated and actually put into good research protocols and measures because some of the early research in the 50s, 60s, and 70s wasn't super well done. Uh, so we're redoing a lot of that early research and finding very similar results. These medicines are super good for people that are ready to use them because they're also really big, powerful agents. Um, but in my experience, there are very few things that help people get clear with their deep core wounds and trauma issues or just the deep areas of the subconscious that we can't readily access on our own. And so bringing up that material so that we can understand it, heal it, integrate it, become more whole, and oftentimes through that, need less psychiatric medications or any at all, and then are able to live our lives better. So if I'm, if I'm working in one or more of those three areas, I tend to work with a variety of different clients. And regardless of their entry or primary symptomatology, we're looking at all four areas of the self, body, mind, heart, and soul. And when we look at each of those areas and we have different assessment systems and tools to be able to understand if each of those areas is in balance, out of balance, if it's out of balance, in which way is it out of balance? Do we need to intervene at the level of the mind or the heart, even if somebody presents with irritable bowel syndrome? So their gut might be manifesting deep trauma that's been held in the system their whole adult life. And while we keep tra chasing it with different novel supplements to support the healing of the digestive system and the intestinal lining and optimize, optimizing nutritional profiles, while all of that can be really helpful, it may not get to the core issue because the core issue could be trauma. And unless we get to the trauma, this person is going to continue to just manage the symptoms on the surface. So we need to understand more deeply and specifically how do we assess where people's deep core issues reside, and then how do we facilitate that healing? I am hearing that you're doing online programs is so vital because then it just fans out around the world. It doesn't, it doesn't eliminate anyone from having this knowledge that I said so readily should be available. And obviously, I mean, people have written books, but to have that kind of support that's online is huge just because now people are able to access and get programs if they don't have the availability, the monetary means, whatever you'd said, they're able to at least start getting educated on these forms to be able to help themselves heal. Mm -hmm. um, there's just such a tremendous um, population of individuals that are seeking it. It doesn't matter. Everyone out there, I always say that if it's, it's your mother, it's your brother, it's your wife, it's your husband, um, it's your aunt, there's no family, there's no person that's not going to be afflicted or have something manifest itself within their life and how they deal with it. The problem is, is um, traditional, like you said, psychiatry, if someone has experienced the death of a loved one, they've been put on a benzodiazepine to deal with it, which might have been great for the intermedium, but long term, 
You know, they, they weren't given any of these other coping mechanisms or tools to be able to recover, truly just to get well. And uh, I love that your approach is so complete. You know, once upon a time way back, you worked at Alternative to Med Center, mm -hmm. but you've mm -hmm. continued, it sounds like, on this amazing journey of continued growth and propelling it out there. Everything about you is about making this message be readily available and pulling something on an online program is just amazing. I mean, to hear that you're doing something of this nature that's helping individuals that don't have the capability to come to you. Um, Cause you're right, you're one person, but one person can make tremendous differences in the world. And it sounds like you're, you're definitely shaking it up. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's certainly with traditional psychiatry you are. I wonder how, you know, how do you, how do you fare when you meet your, uh, your other like, you know, other psychiatrists I think, when you start talking about all these approaches that you do? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Uh, usually if I'm speaking to other psychiatrists, it's because we've been introduced by a mutual friend or they heard me in a talk or a podcast or an interview and they followed up and they were curious about what I was already speaking about. So where, where are the balls already in motion, so to speak? Right. If I just meet psychiatrists in the usual standard of care and we have a conversation with no background, like they don't necessarily know what I'm up to and we just start talking about like the current state of affairs, most psychiatrists are pretty frustrated at their jobs, at the efficacy of the treatments that are being taught and have been taught for the last couple of decades. And they're looking for something new and something different, which is understandable. Uh, I have never really worked in the standard of care. I've always been curious about what was outside of the like standard model that I was taught in residency. And so it was easy for me to start in integrative psychiatry right out of my training. But I understand too that it's, it takes a leap of faith. It takes a uh, stepping outside of the norm and potentially being ridiculed by your peers. Uh, for, for me, it's, it's always, um, I've always been oriented in that direction. So if I'm speaking to other physicians about what it might be like if they change their current treatment model into a more integrative system, oftentimes there's a little bit of resistance or maybe a lot of resistance. Um, because they may be their primary source of income might be in the current standard model, whether they're doing inpatient psychiatry work or outpatient medication management work. And then to gradually change over takes a lot of dedication. It takes time. It takes looking for the current available treatment models that are being uh, offered in an integrative psychiatric setting. Like a friend of mine that I trained with here in Denver 20 years ago, Will Vanderveer just started the Integrative Psychiatric Institute. And it's the first accredited Integrative Psychiatric Fellowship ever. And their first year is this year. And they've got, they already have 120 physicians in that first cohort. Which is I want to, uh, we need to be hooked up with every one of those people. <laughs> Absolutely. It's an incredible number. And it's, just, it's really that, is. that people really want to see what is going to be the next phase of medicine. What are the really effective strategies for helping people not only arrest their symptoms, but actually heal at the core and be able to fully engage their life from a place of empowerment and joy and inspiration and getting in touch with who they are and what they're here to provide back to the collective. As opposed to saying, you know, I'm, this person's stuck with major depression. I'm going to have it my whole life. I'm going to be on medications my whole life because that's, that's been the current psychiatric model for the last 20 to 30 years. And when you, when your physician who you're going to see to help deal with a really crushing experience, otherwise you wouldn't be in his office or her office. When that person says here, take this medication, you're going to have to take it for life. That's like a death sentence. From my perspective, that's a death sentence. That's what happened to me after I had my fifth major concussion when I broke my neck. I started having, actually it was with my fourth one, I started having narcolepsy, which is like really intense sleep attacks. It's, it's the opposite of insomnia. You have hypersomnolence. And I was prescribed Silert, which is a cousin of Ritalin, which is essentially like pharmaceutical cocaine. And it, the shit works. <laughs> you know, through your brain on, they work really freaking well. But it does. <laughs> after two years of that, I realized, uh, I was actually exposed to three years, 
after three years of that, I realized these guys are just going to be fine prescribing me medications for the rest of my life. And they don't have another solution. And I know there is another solution. Just inherently, I knew there was another solution. And I knew I didn't want to be stuck on medications for life. And if I look at the package insert for Siler, it says hepatotoxicity or liver toxicity with long-term use. So, you know, these guys, and, and it's, I'm not blaming them because that's just the medical model. Right. And they didn't know how, how to treat it integratively. So I started changing up my diet. I started taking targeted supplementation. I got completely sober off of all intoxicants. I started being really clear on hyper scheduling my sleep routine. And I made some major life decisions. I actually changed my whole social network because the guys I was hanging out with, we were all just always doing stupid shit, getting ourselves in trouble, drinking a lot on the weekends. And that was not good for healing my brain. So it is one of those where at times we have to really take an honest inventory. If we're going to use an, an AA term, we have to take an honest inventory and say, okay, what is going to be necessary for me to stay in the driver's seat of my own life, to stay in control of my own healing practices and protocols and, and my, the, the strategy moving ahead, I'm going to onboard my physicians and my clinicians and my support staff as this like team around me, but it's still up to me. And so many times, particularly when I was working at ATMC, people are byproducts of this medical model that says we're victims and that we're going to be stuck on pharmaceuticals for life. And it just really like erodes our own self-confidence and our own internal power. And so we need to be able to work with people in, in a strategy of reclaiming our divinity, reclaiming our essence of strength. And I mean, I use divinity not as like a religious term. I just use it as a meaning to, to recognize that we all come from the same spark that started life on the planet. Everybody's life is equally important. Everybody's equally unique and equally genius in being able to provide what their unique message is of hope and service and, and, and offering to the collective. And so when we can unwind like the programming that says we're going to be screwed for life because we have this symptomatology, when that gets rewound into a new operating system of empowerment and inspiration and motivation and faith, like internal faith, not external faith on a particular God, but internal faith that we will heal and that we're going through this process as a means of growth and evolution. And our biggest challenges offer us our best teachings. It's just a matter of like refining the experience and the hero's journey to be able to say like every hero's journey that we get compelled to think about Star Wars with Luke Skywalker and you, what was his name from Avatar, Jake Sully and you know, these like or Neo in the Matrix, all of these stories, the hero goes through this real deep process of their own evolution. And they struggle with that process of evolution, just like we struggle with our own evolution. We're all the heroes of our own journey. So when we can just refine the message and just offer it in a different way that gives people hope, that becomes faith, then that can be, a, that can be the turning point. It was a turning point for me. It's been the turning point for hundreds and hundreds of clients that I've worked with. It's like when you give people the opportunity to come back into faith and who they are and, and the importance of their, of their like place in the tapestry and the family of humanity, that's for so many people like a breath of fresh air and then everything can build from that. I love that whenever you're talking about this is that not only now have you developed this from your own journey and your own story, but when I'm, talking to people and I frequently hear over and over again, you know, that they will rattle off certain diagnoses that they've had. And like you said, they wear it like they're, they're badge, like this is who I am. And you're so right. I always say that if we just ask for the inspiration to have things, tools be put in our path as to what needs to individually heal us, it's amazing how quickly those doors start opening. Mm -hmm. And when it resonates with you, that's what I always tell people. I said, when it resonates with you, move on it. Because those things are put before us. When you, when you find someone that you know is gifted and is giving you information and knowledge that you individually need to heal, listen to it. It's because these, 
these people have been where you've been or they know how to advise to be able to help you scale this um, and learn the knowledge. But then it's just beautiful that you've taken it and moved it to the world. Like you're, you're bringing your knowledge to the world and it's so amazing how in depth that you are when it, everything that you do. I mean, it doesn't matter what component when you're talking about addiction or a brain injury, um, you really are treating the whole person. And it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it's so amazing to actually talk to someone who really honestly is just trying to heal a whole person and look at root problems and look for the solution to deal with each area. Because like you said, you're, you're, you're right on. I mean, just if you deal with the gut health, but you don't deal with the trauma, we're not, we're not getting anywhere. So, um, so we're going to put links below this interview of all of your programs, what you're involved with, how people can get in touch with you. Um, you say that you have, I mean, you do an individual practice. How is it that people can be in contact with you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, there's a few different websites I could point you to. Uh, for my private practice, it's drdanengel.com. D-R-D-A-N-E-N-G-O-E.com. If people have questions, they can uh, email info at drdanningle.com. If people are curious to know more about what we do at Revive, the center here in Denver, that is revivetreatmentcentersplural.com. And our specialty there is acquired brain injury. So stroke, traumatic brain injury, concussion. Oftentimes people have post-concussive syndrome, depression, anxiety, PTSD, as it relates to their head injury. So we're oftentimes dealing with psychiatric experiences and symptomatology as well. Um, the book that you mentioned earlier, Concussion Repair Manual, that's the same URL, concussionrepairmanual.com. And then um, Full Spectrum Medicine is an education advocacy platform that I built for psychedelic medical research. And we're building that platform out as it goes. Uh, to be more um, updated in this next iteration, probably in the next two, two months. Bold, I mentioned to you, that launches in a couple of months. Freedom for Meds launches later this year. Um, there's a lot of stuff moving in the space. How do you have time? <laughs> like, how are you going to do it all? I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, just managing all these different facets. And like you said, I love that you're moving towards training other people so that you're having teams that can also assist and coach people on, on the mentality of what they need to do. Yeah. But I mean, there's only one of you. I know you're really involved in quite a bit of different yeah, things. Yeah, that's, that's maybe 30% of what I'm doing. The, the other two thirds is going to be launched in 2020. Uh, another series of clinics um, based in transformational medicine. I'm writing the transformational medicine text right now um, with a couple of other books. So yeah, this year's big growth year. 2020 is a big growth year. A lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff happening. Dan, thank you for taking the time to do this. I know with your incredibly busy schedule, your work is so needed and so many people are out there seeking someone just like you, that there are integrative people, there's integrative doctors that are truly healing people's lives. So mm -hmm. taking the time to expose your work and put it out there, it's just another resource. So when people, when you hear this uh, podcast, you watch it, you listen to it, there's links that you're going to be able to go on and access so that, you know, you'd be able to learn more about his work individually. Um, thank you for taking the time. I appreciate everything that you're doing within the world. And I love that you're doing it online because it's like pulling it to the next stratosphere. Of, mm -hmm. It's just, there's no boundaries then. There's no boundaries. So there's no, nobody that's going to be um, excluded from being able to get help that they need, at least this educational component, you yeah. know. 100%. But that's wonderful. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah, you're welcome, Debbie. Thank All you. All right.